Cool. Well, welcome to, uh, as Carl said, our, our new office here, and thanks to Ash for being a great landlord. Um, it's funny, since I've walked around and talked to many of you tonight, the first question I get asked by everybody, I'm, if you can't tell by the accent, American and based in California, you know, what prompted you guys to want to have a presence in Stockholm? So we'll talk about that and some other interesting things. And maybe we'll actually start there and then we'll go on a bit of a journey to give you uh, a little bit of our experience, both as tech entrepreneurs and venture capitalists. And then I think ultimately we'd like to get you guys engaged in the conversation as well. So as you think about relevant points that you'd like to contribute or questions, by all means, please uh, contribute. Um, so Carl and I met a couple of years back. We were, um, I had co-founded Sway about six years ago. Carl was working for another tier one firm and we were just casually comparing notes on our philosophies about what it's like to be in venture capital and work with entrepreneurs. And we realized very quickly we were kindred spirits uh, just in terms of our backgrounds, which we'll cover a little bit and how we thought about working with entrepreneurs as, as venture capitalists. And ultimately, we sort of one day said, well, maybe we should be doing this together and uh, really ask Carl to join and run Europe, among other things, for us um, based on similar philosophies, which, which we'll cover. And when we talked about Europe, one of the questions I had asked Carl, notwithstanding he's Swedish, of course, I said, where would you want to put our European headquarters? And he said, most certainly Stockholm. And he, it's safe to say he convinced me of that, but tell us a little bit about your, uh, your logic there. Well, there are a few really interesting ecosystems in Europe. <clears throat> Berlin is one where I've had a lot of success in terms of investing. Of course, London uh, is one uh, ecosystem, and, uh, and and the Nordics out of Stockholm is 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 one. But Stockholm has evolved into really, I'd say, the startup capital of uh, uh, of, of of Europe. And I think uh, what's what's led to that is, I mean, and and in the last year or two, it certainly has 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 proven itself to be that beyond anybody's doubt, right? Because we've had such tremendous. Uh, uh, high-profile exits, and, and on a per capita basis, there's no question that we have more uh, unicorns uh, per capita, more, uh, you know, more, more money uh, allocated per capita uh, to, to startups than, than any other city in the, um, in, in the world, uh, I mean, certainly in, in, in Europe. But, but we're second, as far as an ecosystem, only really to Silicon Valley. Uh, but but why, why, why that has happened and why... Well, we're here because of those reasons, but why that has happened, at least my theory is that Sweden has always been very export driven and very focused on the rest of the world. And I think one of the things that make Swedish startups go global so quickly is because every entrepreneur here that starts a company starts looking at, uh, at, uh, at the global angle of what they're doing from day one. They don't start thinking, let's see how we can be a really cool Swedish startup. Everybody looks at how can we conquer the world? And I don't think, you know, in France, you don't do it that way. You figure, let's be best that, in France. That's the, in, that's the Viking mentality, right? Yeah. Heck, you know, we've been doing that for years, right? For <laughs> at least since the, since the eight, <clears throat> 800s or so. But, uh, but, but no, uh, we've had this whole, let's go, let's go uh, out uh, from, from the onset, I guess, since the Viking ages. I was going to say, since many of the early entrepreneurial Massive entrepreneurial successes, everything from Swedish Match to from 100 years ago to to uh, Ericsson and IKEA and H and M and what have you. But but certainly on a tech scene, it's 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 become the same. Where where every Swedish tech company starts looking at at again the world uh, as their market rather than the domestic market as their market, and and that's different from. Just about any, I mean, in Germany even, you don't do that. In France, you don't do it. You look at your domestic market first, and then, well, gee, if you get traction, then you figure out how do we go beyond. Um, but that's not how you do it in Sweden. I think that's why we have the situation we have. Yep, and I, that resonates with me having, you know, we've backed some companies here. We're working on a bunch of other deals and working with other investment groups. I mean, we're, we're entrepreneurs who have done the journey so many times that we're, we're over, over, over time, we've become pretty good at, uh, it's like riding a bicycle, you know, initially, 
might be a little difficult to get up on. And once you once you learn it, you sort of figure out the pattern, and you you uh, you know, the, uh, riding a bike becomes pretty easy. And I think that's a little bit like what we uh, what we do. And um, and and I certainly much prefer to be there uh, to uh, to figure out how I can mentor an entrepreneur or or <clears throat> or help augment his skill sets if I need to, and or his or her, and um, and, and how. Um, how we can leverage our experience into uh, enhanced success, and again mitigate it down, mitigate downside risk, and, and, and optimize upside. Uh, and um, and I think when you're when you're more doing the financial engineering thing and strategizing, you add value at the board meeting perhaps, but we add most of our value in between the board meetings and by really being there uh, and, and, and and taking calls in the middle of the night, which I'm sure both of us have done. And being on the phone for that entrepreneur for hours sometimes, and and flying over to spend three days with him or her when uh, when there's something that's that's you know that's not going right, and I think that's also how we actually win deals because we are entrepreneurs. When an entrepreneur, when I'm sitting down with an entrepreneur, <clears throat> at least I generally ask the question, "What's your worst fear?" And they tell me their worst fear, and then then I uh, I ask them because most of the time we're up against financial uh, investors or sort of you know, people that have more of that kind of background. And then um, I ask them, who do you think is going to be able to help you if your worst fear comes to reality? Those guys or, or us? Um, generally, the answer is, yeah, I think you guys can. Uh, and then if I don't win the deal right there, then they, uh, that's often because they say, well, but those guys are willing to pay 20% more. And then usually my comeback is, I'm sure that's yours too, uh, is, well, are you taking any money off the table right now on this round? And generally they say, no, not really allowed to, okay? So what really matters to you is not what the valuation is today, but where the valuation is going to be two or three years from now, and who do you think is going to help you make sure that the valuation is optimized two or three years from now, those financial investors or us? And that's when we really win the deal, and I think we, we almost always win the deal at, at that point because we are entrepreneurs, and when we're dealing with a European company in particular, or a Swedish company, whatever, uh, <clears throat> most, most of the entrepreneurs realize that in addition to wanting to have an entrepreneur that's there to support them, they also realize that they really would like, if they have their choice, to have a U.S. firm uh, work with them. And not a lot of U.S. firms are actually chasing deals and have a physical presence here. And certainly in Stockholm, I think we're the only ones with a physical presence. But, but the reason we win the deal also in part by being a U.S. firm, is because most European entrepreneurs ultimately want to go into the U.S. market. Yeah, on that point, Carl, um, when we were comparing notes on European companies and how to best support them, it reminds me I had a meeting at our office here in Stockholm this morning, and it is a, a really fascinating company that some of you may know that's providing artificial intelligence as a service to education publishers and trying to understand the specific learning approach that each individual, perhaps at a university here in Stockholm, is taking, and then condition and feed the education, the curriculum material, in a way that's very compelling for that particular student. Um, and they're, they're in revenue, they've got several European publishers, um, they're, they're, they're on a good trajectory. And we asked the entrepreneur, what are you looking for um, in an investor, and they said, well, 85 of the 100 largest education publishers in the world are happen to be in the United States, so we would love to work with somebody that can help us access that marketplace from a position of strength. And that's similar to what you talked about earlier, about you know, part of it's the Viking mentality of conquer the world, but part of it's a very pragmatic approach of there are markets overseas, whether it's the US or Asia, uh, Etc. that can compel people to drive things. So Carl had a philosophy that we've been conditioned to become part of our own thinking now called transatlantic arbitrage. Yeah. Maybe you could explain that. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, when, 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 we, uh, when, when we can help a European firm or a Swedish firm uh, gain traction in the U.S., uh, then what happens is uh, something quite magical. Once they have that traction, uh, all of a sudden their valuation generally goes up highly disproportionately to, to, to their operational growth just because you have so much more money chasing deals in the U.S. than you do over here. Uh, so, um, 
uh, and, and of course, all of a sudden, if you're able to get your money at a third of the cost or you're able to increase your valuation so you can bring in a lot more money without diluting yourself too much, then that's a pretty blessed situation for an entrepreneur. And, and I think we're really good at helping make that happen. And yeah, I call that transatlantic arbitrage because, again, that dramatic additional growth effect uh, on valuation that you get when you, when you actually can get traction in the U.S., and it's not enough to just enter the market. You actually have to show that people embrace your product and, and, uh, and, and love what you do over there. But uh, I've had the, the good fortune of being able to do that for a few companies, and, uh, and it's worked out quite magnificently each time, fortunately. And, and what's interesting is the transatlantic arbitrage. It works both ways across the pond because I tend to look after U.S. investments, although I'm involved in several of the deals here that Carl and our colleague Arnaud, who's with us, uh, have driven. And 100% uh, of our portfolio companies in the US are looking to access Europe and Sweden as a part of that. So if you can create that, uh, that connective tissue to European organizations, enterprises, institutions, marketplaces, et cetera, uh, US-based uh, technology companies are very, very passionate about getting that type of support. So it's being in that fairly unique position uh, to support both European and US-based portfolio companies. Yep. Although I would say the more dramatic valuation enhancement effect, you probably go, go uh, you get going from here to there. But yes, you're absolutely right. It does go both ways. Uh, and as far as, um, I mean, to, to, to tonight, we're kind of fortunate to have others here that have a like philosophy. I guess we've got you know, the NASDAQ guys here, uh, <coughs> two of them, uh, who, um, who are obviously, I would assume, share, given your focus on, on, on the Nordic markets in Sweden, share the philosophy that there are some really interesting companies to support through, through exit over here. So um, I don't think we're entirely alone in having the philosophy that there are amazingly good companies here. But what I think makes us quite unique right now is that we are the only ones that actually have opened the a physical office presence here. Qu question for you about the tech scene here. So in June, we were both fortunate enough to attend uh, Ash, uh, Ash's conference, Brilliant Minds, um, and had really interesting discussions with, you know, Daniel from Spotify, of course, is uh, a key figure in, in the conference as well. But just about the, the culture of startups here, you talked about a desire for kind of manifest destiny of going overseas to markets, but what do you think the culture of innovation, what typifies that in Sweden? Because there's a very technology-centric development-first engineering approach to building companies where we have some of the best engineers in the world are right here in Sweden. What, why do you think that is? Well, I think that we do have some incredibly strong universities uh, uh, that, that have helped foster that. But I think what's also happened is that because of the fact that we had the good fortune of having some tremendous uh, entrepreneurial successes uh, quite early, some 20 years ago in Sweden, you've had a good amount of very tech-focused um, people affiliated with those deals that made some good money already way back when. So, so that created you know, a tremendous acceleration effect, I think, to, uh, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to kind of lead to this environment that we have today, where you had a lot of on, uh, engineers that actually proved that being a really smart engineer helps you make money. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and that made others realize that studying engineering and pursuing uh, engineering and being a bit of a computer nerd actually is quite cool and can be monetized and can be quite become quite sexy, if you will, compared to where uh, it might be where it might be seen as in in many other cultures and countries. So you know, I think again, the early start of it, the tremendous you know, really strong academic environment that we have, and uh, and and the whole cultural way of looking at it as as kind of cool to be a, a bit of a computer nerd is uh, is is all helping that. Yeah, it's great, great to see the, the community here. And it is, when we travel around, Carl mentioned, you know, Berlin is obviously a, a center of excellence for technology startups. There's Paris, London, Tel Aviv, et cetera. But it is interesting when we travel across 
greater Europe, we do actually hear people hold Sweden and Stockholm in particular in, in very high regard for having you know, probably the most advanced culture of innovation, uh, certainly in the region, uh, and, and, and on par you know, with the Silicon Valleys of the world globally. So yeah. it's been exciting to look at opportunities here. Maybe you could talk a little bit about, for Sway Ventures, as you think about the next set of companies that we will back here, what are you looking for and how do you find them? Well, I think we are looking for companies that are taking on solving very complicated technical problems. Uh, I think we look here for the same thing we look for anywhere. Uh, and we're obviously looking at something that caters to some of the themes that we have found to be, 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 um, <clears throat> be of interest to us. Uh, but what we're first and foremost, I think, looking for are, are entrepreneurs that give us the confidence that they can actually see the initial success that they created before we even start looking at them uh, through to, um, uh, to, to again, uh, global success and that they can be the kind of leaders that they need to be in order to uh, recruit the rest of the team members and, and, and set the tone for, for what they need to do in order to, um, to take the startup uh, into a, um, uh, and scale that into a, uh, a large global enterprise. Uh, and, and I do think that to a greater extent than many other parts of the world, you do find that here. Uh, you do find that here because, again, uh, <clears throat> for some reason, we do have an awful lot of, 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 uh, of just really strong managers alongside of, and, and people that are just culturally very organized and, and, and have a work ethic that, uh, that's hard to beat. Um, so, um, so, so I think there are, there are some culturally driven factors that also help ensure that, that a lot of the people here are not just you know, good innovators, but they're actually good managers and devoted, dedicated, hardworking people. Obviously, yeah. I'm Swedish. I'm somewhat partial and subjective. <laughs> but since most of you guys are Swedish too, you probably agree with me. I and mean, we're pretty good. Some amount of bias is healthy. Yeah, there is. There is a bit of bias. There is. I guess for those of you in the room, we'd love to hear what, what it is about Stockholm and Sweden that you guys think make make this oh, such an interesting marketplace? Yeah. Um, what frustration? Nothing's perfect. What are the downsides of Stockholm? What do you find in Stockholm, Sweden, that, that kind of is missing? Well, now nothing. I mean, before what was missing was us having a physical presence and being here to help take these companies to the next level. But now, you know. It's utopia. We are pretty much lacking absolutely nothing in this market. But, but you know, that was different two weeks ago. But uh, we fixed that. No, but, um, but uh, seriously, I, um, I haven't really um, uh, contemplated that an awful lot. But. Evaluations, uh, or and I can't think what it might be, but nothing's perfect. Right. No, I, I do think that, that the thing that might be lacking at times is, but, but you know, that the right investor can actually fix is <coughs> the, uh, you know, the, the ambition is always there to go global, but then the ability to actually make that happen is n not necessarily always uh, matching the ambition to do so. Uh, but again, the good thing is that at least I haven't seen any uh, any major ego issues holding you back from that. Um, I was going to say some 10, 15 years ago, as I was investing in, in, in German companies, I would see a bit of, of, of this, you know, we don't need advice because we're so damn good and we're, uh, you know, we are who we are in this nation. Uh, in Sweden, you just don't have that level of arrogance either in terms of we're so much better than anybody, we don't need advice from anyone. But Swedes are generally quite open to, uh, to feedback and advice and and have a sense of humility that I think is just so refreshing when you come in as an investor and want to, uh, want to help someone. Uh, Jim, I would add to that. I think the, the capital market here for you know, fund managers, venture capital and strategics has come a long way in the last five to six years. Um, so I think it's actually very, um, I'm not going to say easy, but not difficult to find access to seed capital in Sweden. 
And some of that, are there, we had several of our friends from the fund management community here in Stockholm at the, at the event tonight. Um, and there also, there's a very well-developed angel network. You know, when you have massive liquidity events like Spotify, whether they're former employees or investors, there are some fairly liquid people in Sweden that are looking to find the next, you know, set of Spotify. So I'm actually impressed with um, capital that you can get at the seed stage. I think as you get into the alphabetical letters, A, B, C, et cetera, you know, it, it, it gets a little bit more difficult. So I would, I would answer it to say that I think Sweden, just as it matures as an innovation scene, would be great to see more capital here, whether it's fund managers from other territories like ourselves and or local indigenous fund managers. That'll be important. Of course, you have Atomico here, so Nicholas and his team, you know, they can do anything from seed to growth and are very active, but you, you would like to see, you know, 8, 10, 12, 15, 20 Atomicos that can easily price and lead an A, a B, you know, a C round. I think that'll be important as the, as the innovation scene here grows up. Yeah, but you are quite right, actually. That's, that's an excellent point. You do have uh, access to seed capital uh, disproportionately from other European cities, I think, as a consequence of, again, the entrepreneurial success, but also as a consequence of, of a few uh, government initiatives that, uh, that exist in, in the Swedish market that's also, uh, I'd say, quite, a bit, quite, quite superior to, to what you see in many other uh, uh, European cities. I have a question or a reflection. What about access to, um, to talent? I mean, Stockholm is a small city, Sweden is a small country, the Nordic region is fairly small. The, the amount of talented people is limited. And importing people to this part of the world proves often very difficult for several reasons. There's no way of finding a place to live if you can deal with the darkness and the cold uh, taxes and all that. And, uh, how does that work? I, I would actually say you talked about bringing people here. A couple of months ago, I spent a couple of days in what are known as the no-go zones here uh, outside of Greater Stockholm, where you have a, a pretty sizable immigrant population of people immigrating from North Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, India, etc. Um, and I was struck by, you know, one, just the sheer magnitude of how many immigrants Sweden has. I mean, your immigration policies here are, you know, frankly, much friendlier and more pragmatic, I think, than, you know, so many other countries, including the one uh, that I hail from, given our most recent uh, president. But I would tell you, you know, I met hundreds of, I call them kids, but, you know, 18, 18 to, let's say, 25, sort of that range. And when I asked them, you know, when, when you grow up, what, what do you want to be? I mean, some of them wanted to be hip hop stars and be the next Tupac, but most of them wanted something to do with technology and the digital revolution. And many of them were taking online courses or enrolling themselves at City College or were fortunate enough to be part of a progressive uh, high school here in, in Sweden that was giving them the opportunity to learn formally about innovation. And I think as these uh, young adults mature and grow up, it actually creates a massive advantage for Sweden if, if we can tap this talent correctly. So I think there's you know, the indigenous peoples of Sweden, who of course are multicultural, but also this, this immigrant population that you have here, it is a towering strength. And I think the, the onus, frankly, is on all of us that participate in this digital economy to figure out how can we provide access pathways to these young people that are coming up who want to be part of this digital revolution? And besides that, <clears throat> I think that, again, a lot of the companies that we're making reference to also, by definition of, of how these Swedish companies grow, are growing outside of Sweden. So a lot of, of, of their long-term success depends on how effective they are in recruiting not people to bring to Sweden, but how they recruit people to head up their UK operation, their US operation, their Germany operation, whatever it might be. So <clears throat> that's where, again, I think well-equipped, skilled VCs that can help with that is actually a really important part of the equation. And within Europe, I think there are quite a few that can help uh, with, with, with scaling, and I think we pride ourselves in being able to help make the leap 
both throughout Europe, but also into the US, with a relatively minimal management bandwidth distraction on the, uh, on, on the core team here in Sweden. Uh, <clears throat> so, so I think a lot of that scaling up and building the team is not requiring the bringing of people into Sweden, but it's requiring, on behalf of that Swedish company, recruiting the team that they need wherever they're going to grow in those markets that they are pursuing. Anyone else have a perspective on... Uh... Mr. Nasdaq. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it, it, tell us something. Why, why are you so bullish on this market? And, uh, and are you seeing some of the same things that we're seeing in terms of, uh, of, of uh, a, a growth in, uh, in, in, in this, whole, you know, this whole entrepreneurial trend that we are talking about? And are you uh, seeing that you're able to help some of those companies do their exits here in Sweden? Uh, and or raise money through the public markets here, or are you guiding most of them uh, to, to uh, NASDAQ in the US? No, but I think, um, so I think one of the fundamental differences between this market, uh, the Swedish market, in, <coughs> and the US market, and many of the other, other European markets is that if you look at the last uh, 500 IPOs that we've done here, 90% uh, of those are below 6 billion in Swedish market cap. The Swedish Kroner market cap. So that's roughly, if you make an easy translation, 600 million in market cap. And in the US, those IPOs don't happen uh, because you have to be around 600 million in uh, US dollars in market cap to justify the cost of listing. But here you have an equity culture, which means that every household owns shares in some form, uh, either through funds or directly. So yeah, there's an equity culture here, which is unrivaled in Europe. Uh, which means that we're, we're punching above our weight. Uh, it means that here, if you're an entrepreneur launching a company, even though tax rates are high, people understand the value of options and shares. In Italy, for example, that doesn't exist. Uh, so here you have a fundamental understanding of the value of uh, you know, being a part of something that from the beginning. Uh, and, and I think that's a strength which is unique. Uh, and if you look at these you know, 500 IPOs that we've had. In Europe last year, you probably had, you know, uh, in Germany you had 10 IPOs. Uh, uh, and you so had how many here? Here we had 119. And so it's just, you know, and EQT Ventures invested in one of the companies just recently that is listed with us because essentially they're replacing risk capital with the exchange because it comes at a lower cost, it's more accessible, it's more achievable and so on, but they're yet they're replacing risk capital with the exchange. So at the end of the day, this doesn't exist in the US because in the US you have angel investors, you have VCs, you have everything. So we need, even though the ecosystem here has been strengthened with more money, Creandum, North Zone, Legstar, Atomico, you know, Bolton, all of them are here, active, we still need more and more VC money uh, for this growth environment that we're having. Uh, and in the lack of that environment, uh, the exchange has played a fundamental role. And it's the same drivers. Everybody thinks global. Uh, everybody thinks, uh, you know, from a technology point of view, everybody has the same drivers as you see that VC is there to fund. And ideally, many of these companies should not be on the exchange. And if there is more VC money to support these kind of companies, uh, they should thrive and grow in the private world and then come to the exchange. But fundamentally, we are here to support these companies. Uh, and uh, we see in a unique environment here in Sweden, which is unrivaled on a European level. One of the interesting things that I've, <clears throat> that I've uh, noted as well is that not only is the average Joe quite savvy as an investor, but even the institutional investors here are very astute and progressive and in fact, for us, we have seen institutions here come and embrace venture capital and invest with us. And, and we've been quite successful in, in, in raising money in Sweden as well, I think, as a consequence of, again, this progressive investor mentality. And where, again, we found that even though we're a fairly new fund, I mean, we've only been around for five years or so, uh, and haven't done that many fund cycles, but some of the institutional investors have emerging manager programs uh, that, that means that they can kind of toss 30, 40, 50 million dollars uh, onto relatively new managers in ways that many 
uh, 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 you know, institutional managers in other countries you know, aren't, aren't as comfortable with. So we've seen the progressiveness here amongst the institutions as well. Unrivaled equity culture. And that right. means that they're willing to take risk in the private and in the public environment. Uh, and again, if you look at the concept of 90% of those 450 IPOs that we've done are below 6 billion in market cap, Swedish market cap, mm -hmm. uh, then that means you have institutional money that understands how to support SMEs, <clears throat> whether they're technology, whether in this trust, industrial or traditional businesses. But you say a lot of those companies should not be listed, which sounds as though you're right. No. Do they not perform then? Well, no, uh, they no liquidity after I'm listing. not saying that they should not be listed. What I'm saying is that the fundamental concept of the listing is replacing risk capital. Mm. That means that if you're investing in these companies, you should not invest in them as if you were investing in a mature company. You're investing in them with a different risk profile. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look at the first north market, which our first north market, a growth market is called, the return of investment on first north over the last three, four years is 80%. Uh, if you look at the main market, it's probably around 10%, if even. Can you, can you so, put, you know, if it, overall, it's a risk return rate, which is more parallel to VC money than the... Than therefore, ridiculous valuations, because there's money chasing them, or not? So are those the ones with 80% return? No, Have no, they got absurd valuations or not? No, no it's not absurd no? valuations. It's, uh, I mean, market-driven valuations. Uh, I mean, I would say that even VC valuations, I mean, the, the challenge that you have with VC money here is that 10 years ago or six years ago, uh, the Swedish <coughs> VC would say the difference between us and the US VC is that we would tell a company they only need $1 million. Uh, nowadays, the Swedish VC will say that they need $10 million to mm -hmm. go global. And they, they're saying the same thing as the US. Uh, and w w is that good or bad? But, uh, fun, you know, so uh, at the end of the day, there's more capital. Everybody's looking for a return on investment. And uh, the only difference between the public and the private environment is that public environment is more accessible because it reaches to the home. Uh, private environment, you can't access Sway Ventures. You can't access... But that's why institutional money is looking to invest in private environment because there's a lot of growth happening in that space. Mm -hmm. and. and uh, there's so many different dynamics, but fundamentally the same drivers that we're talking about here, that is, the entrepreneur thinks global, good governance, uh, everybody speaks English, very little red, red, little red tape, uh, it's very transparent. Mm. Uh, all these fundamental factors play into that there is a strong ecosystem for growth. The whole world is, I think, noticing also right now with uh, Sweden is becoming an even more powerful global investor in the VC space and in the alternative investment space, uh, I think also through some regulatory change, I think the AP system is just going through uh, a government mandate change from having <clears throat> been directed to allocate only 5% of their total funds to, uh, uh, to private equity uh, and or alternative assets, uh, uh, which is now going up to 40%. Uh, so, so Sweden is right now kind of a hot destination even for fund managers around the world. Uh, I think we've been fortunate to tap that market even while they only had 5% <laughs> available, which makes us feel a bit blessed. But, um, but I think that, that that progressiveness is coming through in so many ways and so many different, uh, uh, you know, um, so many different dimensions to that. But it's exciting. Uh, and, uh, and again, all those reasons are, uh, are, are good reasons for why we're here. Agreed. So Ash, what do you say? <clears throat> you've been an active investor in this market, and what have you seen over the last uh, several years while you've been active? What, have, what are some of the things that have changed uh, since you started investing in the tech sector some 10, 15 years ago to now? And, uh, and are you excited about what's, what's happening? Are, you, uh, are there concerns? But I can tell you, I think one of the drivers is role models. And I, and I believe that in any sector, it doesn't really relate to tech specifically. I just think based on the success that Sweden has, it just you know reinforces the newcomers to, to want to try and be brave enough to try and go for the, for the big ideas. And obviously then the rest follows. I think that's one of the aspects that, that has helped the tech scene specifically is like how 
Swedish entrepreneurs have been so successful and are in turn role models for the next batch. Um, and I see that very clearly, and I think that's one of the key aspects to why Sweden has kept on delivering. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, that's true. I mean, clearly the whole role model thing and the whole we are entrepreneurs, supporting entrepreneurs is sort of our competitive advantage as well. Uh, Brian, that leads me to, uh, why don't you share a little bit about yeah, your background so at least we, we sort of uh, know who, or everybody gets to know a little bit about who we are, I suppose, and why we, um, we believe that, uh, or why we are seeing ourselves as entrepreneurs supporting other entrepreneurs. Happy what to. got you into yeah, venture capital? Well, I, so I'm a, a somewhat of a rare breed. Silicon Valley, uh, which is where I was raised, um, actually hasn't been around that long. It's really only since been, I think, since the 1970s when companies like Intel and Apple, you know, first came into view. My father actually got recruited to be an executive uh, at a startup uh, back in the 70s, a technology startup, and so we moved. To Silicon Valley back then it was orchards, apple orchards, apricot orchards. Um, so it looked very, very different uh, than the landscape that you see today. And I, I didn't grow up thinking about being a tech entrepreneur, but I suppose through osmosis I was just around it. Um, it was what was happening uh, in the region at that time. And so um, I, I started my career at big tech companies, uh, but after a few years of that realized you know, at my very core, I was more of a risk taker. You know, that was my profile, and I, I couldn't take as much risk as I wanted to take inside of, you know, large monolithic multinational corporations. And so I took the plunge and went in uh, to a startup in the in the 1990s. You know, venture backed with uh, some of the, the the tier one names that you guys would know by now, and I I. Um, Ended up doing that about four times, uh, serially, um, you know, where you have blinders on and you work for several years and it's go, go, go and try to make a success of that. Um, and I think one of the things, you learn a lot about yourself in that, but you also learn a bit about how some of these markets function. And so it's funny, you know, listening to the, you know, our, our friends from NASDAQ, you know, it's a marketplace. So they're looking at hundreds of IPOs every year and they, they can find an economic interest in all of those. And so I think in, in my own journey, I woke up a few years ago and realized I don't want to be a serial entrepreneur, I would like to be a parallel entrepreneur. Uh, for those of you that spend any time in casinos, the worst odds in the house are roulette, the best odds in the house are craps. So the, the logic was how do I start playing craps and, <laughs> and spreading some bets around the table and becoming a fund manager and getting into venture capital was one way to do that. And uh, to, your, to your question about the approach, and you, you had said as much earlier, I do think fundamentally it sort of takes an entrepreneur to know an entrepreneur. Uh, specifically, how do you help these people when everything's going great and you have a good quarter and sales are off the charts and you're growing? Um, it's actually hard to attribute success uh, very specifically. It's, success can mask lots of different underlying factors in a company that may not be going so well. And when you experience a modicum of failure, the opposite is true. It very much crystallizes exactly what's wrong with this business or this marketplace or this team or this corporate culture. And so I think with Sway Ventures, what we've tried to do is assemble folks like Carl and myself who have deep entrepreneurial backgrounds and have walked a few thousand kilometers in the shoes of some of the very same uh, emerging leaders that we're trying to back. And I think it helps you empathize. Carl made the point earlier about picture your worst nightmare coming true. Who do you want in the trenches with you? You know, at that point in time, one of one of my mentors in this business told me years ago that you know the difference between the investor that can empathize with an entrepreneur versus others who are just thinking purely about their own financial interest. The founder slash CEO, she's sitting in a foxhole and there's bullets whizzing by and grenades you know, going overhead. And the less entrepreneurial friendly investor is basically tearing off her boots and trying to sell that for scrap on the secondary market. And the more entrepreneurial focused are handing her cartridges of bullets so she can carry on on the fight. And I think that's symbolic of the way 
uh, that we at Sway Ventures think about back in I love that analogy. <laughs> that's, that's, really, that's really good. But yes, it is, it is true.